I was thinking, I've been thinking about a lot of these topics lately in anticipation of tonight, and I was looking at these beautiful sunsets we've been having lately. Has anyone else been really struck by these? And I, I truly enjoy them, but then this sort of sustainability cynic creeps in, right? And I think, how much particulate matter is affecting the colors of those sunsets, right? Like, this is my thinking. I'm like, oh, you don't ruin it for yourself. But it's just being, you know, a realistic look at our sunsets. And you know, when there's major fire somewhere, our sunsets get amazing, right? Because we share the same air as everyone else on this planet. And our sunsets reflect the fires that are burning elsewhere. And so I really love the Van Jones' message because he says, hey, we're all in this together, right? Little plastic bottle that travels around that's affecting all of us, right? Um, and uh, the way that he brings these environmental issues, yes, I could be concerned about the particulate matter staining my sunset, but it also is impacting the quality of our lives, um, not in just an aesthetic way, right? Um, so I paired these two talks together because I think they're a great reminder for us um, that we, to make our places great and to develop as a strong and sustainable community, we have a lot to consider, right? It's not just the trees or the children, right? It's, it's everything. So hopefully they've pulled these things together. So um, I'm not going to say too much more because we have three amazing people here with their own take on what we've been doing um, with these uh, topics. So uh, first, we have uh, Becky Reimbold. She is the proprietor of a, a little shop called Just Goods. Uh, and uh, she'll be talking about what, uh, why she does what she does with her, her store and what it's all about and how that fits in. We also have with us uh, Scott Ford. He's the director of uh, the uh, Economic and Community Development Department here with the city of South Bend. And uh, we have uh, actually a last-minute sub, uh, I'm very thankful, uh, Trina Bailey. Uh, who has a great last name, and uh, is here with, uh, she's the uh, Director of Operations at Bridges to Digital Excellence, filling in for the director who has the flu or something. So we did not want him here. As wonderful as the speaker is, he is, Trina's going to fill us in on the, the role that Bridges to Digital Excellence plays in our community. So um, if you give them your attention, I'm just going to pass it to, just to Becky, and she's closest, so. Great, thank you. Um, <coughs> I just want to say thanks to Krista and Mike and everybody on the board and um, at the office there at the Center for Sustainable Future for hosting this and for inviting me. Um, I was fairly giddy coming over here tonight. Like, I just love these talks. Um, uh, they're, they're just all about my own personal passions and, and what I do at work and in the community. And um, I think they're they're excellent, so good choices. Um, Just Goods is Indiana's oldest sustainable living general store. So all the products we have in the store um, are made sustainably. We look at people and the planet. So as you can see, these talks, especially the second one, imagining the arm around the, the child and the tree, that's exactly <laughs> exactly what we do at Just Goods. We talk about being where people and planet meet. And we mean that in a literal sense of um, being in a walkable community where, where neighbors run into each other in the store and find out about events or a class or a, a new food co-op that's going to be coming down the street. Um, um, but it's also where the, the issues of social justice and um, environmental sustainability come together. Um, it's one of the reasons why I'm so excited uh, for the center here at IUSB because um, they, a lot of times it's true that sustainability in people's minds tend to mean the planet. And um, I have for a long time seen it, that both issues really tied together. And I think when I started Just Goods, um, I was looking particularly at the apparel industry. And so um, to me, if you have an organic cotton t-shirt, but the the cotton was picked by children who aren't going to school, then it's not sustainable. So, um, so those issues come together in a lot of our products and how they're produced. And so that's what we try to do. A um, couple other little comments. Um, in terms of the plastics talk, some of the things that we do at the store are we, we don't sell a lot of plastic products. 
Um, as a matter of fact, I was very anti-plastic when I started. <coughs> Like that's, there will be no plastic in just goods. It's just nasty. Um, but you know, over time, you you start you get requests from customers. You try to start to figure out are there appropriate uses for plastic. And so we just try to be really conscientious about choosing plastics that are made out of recycled materials. They're not generating new plastic from new petroleum. Um, and and just, just sort of keeping them to a minimum, showing other options, discussing it with customers, um, doing, trying to do some education about that. We have some fair trade products from around the world where they're, they're made out of recycled water sachets or you know, drink packages or something that are made into bags. Um, also just choosing durable products, things that won't wear out quickly. Um, but I think my friend Christine Fjordalis, who's been very involved with the Sierra Club here locally and at the state level, um, I remember her giving me some words of wisdom a while ago about when, when I mean, petroleum products actually are incredibly useful. We've, we've done a lot of good in the world, um, but we just aren't very thoughtful about it for the most part. So there are times when it's appropriate, but we just, we just need to be more thoughtful. Um, let's see, then the, with Ilana, I guess the, the tie-in with Just Goods is that we've always been in a walkable neighborhood, and that's where we always will be. We've, we've moved once, but we've always been where people can walk or ride their bike to the store, and we feel it's really important to be in a, a community like that. And for the owner to be able to walk to work is really great, too. <laughs> so it's pretty convenient that way. So with that, I think I'll pass it on. Thank you. Uh, I want to echo Becky's comments about uh, the enthusiasm for the event. I myself was also quite thrilled when I got the invite and want to commend uh, Krista and Mike for putting this together. Both the topic and the format. As a former graduate student myself, I know how difficult it can be to attract sort of national speakers on, on sort of a, a semester budget. So I think this is phenomenal. If I look at the scope of uh, uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the talks that are going to come through this fall and this spring, uh, getting a great overview of some issues that are um, obviously central to the matter of sustainability and a really uh, timely right now in South Bend. Um, just to understand the audience, quick show of hands, how many folks here before this video were familiar with smart growth? The term smart growth. Okay. And how many folks um, had heard, uh, heard of the Congress for the New Urbanism? Okay. Um, well, I appreciate that. That's uh, uh, just a little bit about my background. I grew up next to uh, I grew up in Detroit, which I like to refer to as the ghost of Christmas future. Um, and, and so at an early age, I was sort of tipped off to uh, the, the, the challenges we face in both, in both in an urban realm and also suburban realm and how these things touch upon every aspect of our lives. And uh, there's a quote that both that Chris referenced in, in describing both Van and, and Lana's talks uh, that reminded me of um, Francis Tibbalt, who's a, an English architect, and he likened the problem in contemporary development to the Big Bang. And that, you know, at the turn of the last century, around 1900, you had the formally unified professions of planning, design, development, engineering, you know, you ha what have it. They mo more or less were guided by the same principles towards the same end. Um, and that exploded. And you have all these discrete professions moving in opposite directions at increasing speeds, developing their own language, and they never talk to each other. And um, the net result are, are the problems we face today. And, um, you know, and one of the things that I, um, I sort of beat this drum recently in, in my new role, uh, and I should say the Department of Community Investment, it's been rebranded, uh, we got away from uh, community and economic development because we thought that was a false silo uh, between two different roles. It's actually an integrated approach. And um, if you were to, to scan any sort of economic development literature these days, you're going to hear lots of big numbers, like, oh, so-and-so is attracting $100 million in investment, and they're creating X number of jobs. And those are really important numbers. But what we failed to do is put those numbers in place. So I keep hitting that drum. We need to put those numbers in place. And uh, if you were to look uh, at a community, I'm not going to name it, but if it's halfway between South Bend and Chicago, it's the poster child for economic development in Indiana in 2012. And it's a nightmare. It's you know it's seven lanes of traffic. You've got you know sort of decaying carcasses of strip malls about half a mile away from from new investment. And um, what we need to do is we need to think about those numbers in a different way and sort of put them in a place. Um, and so as you know moving forward it, it, to achieve that in, in the city of South Bend, um, I should say there's, it's a real exciting time. A new administration, a lot of people get it. And uh, 
um, we're thinking about economic development in, in that sort of comprehensive way. We've reorganized the team. Um, we've got everything from planning to neighborhood and community engagement and economic resources sort of at the table in any conversation. Um, and we're thinking about how we, um, and I'll speak to that later, but, um, but you know, in terms, just we're with a metaphor, and I'll just leave you with this as we pass along, but uh, um, the, if you think about the smartphone, as an interesting metaphor for our time, as sort of this interesting device. And one thing, it's sort of the triumph of design on, on one hand, but I would say more importantly, it represents the integration of hardware and software. Because uh, you have your apps on a smartphone, and if you take them off of the phone, they're not that, you, they're not, there's nothing particularly distinguishing about it. It might as well be on the internet. Uh, likewise, with the, the, the portability that you're afforded with the hardware. But if you don't have that integrated view of the hardware and software, um, it's just, it's not the same, it doesn't create the value. So looking at our places, you need to think of how do we change the hardware, the physical environment, uh, and create those places that matter, um, but also the software, which is the economic culture. And one without the other is not sufficient. You can, you can pour millions of dollars. I just came from a presentation tonight. City pumped $1.9 million onto Western Avenue um, on the west side in the last 10 years, and arguably for, for minimal benefit to the residents or for the community. So you need to think about how you put those numbers in place. But I look forward to continuing the conversation, but I just, uh, I'm, again, thank you, and I'm thrilled by the topic. Hello, I'm Trina Bailey, and I have been tripping over exactly his segue, electronics for the last seven years. This phone I got in December of last year, and already there are three new versions of this exact phone. So what happens, to this disposable electronics that we haven't thought about. 10 years ago, everybody owned a VCR player. How many still own one today? Very few. <coughs> Once upon a time, all of these things, they used to be just thrown into the landfill. And then we would have to extract more of these precious metals and this petroleum and this, this material that we need to create the new latest and greatest product as we dispose of the old one. So our goal is to, first of all, stop this from finding its way into the landfill. Second of all, I am a nonprofit, and the reason for that is this can be a revenue stream. The circuitry inside these cell phones, they have gold and palladium and, and silver and all sorts of material that is valuable. So most places will, that recycle properly will send it to an organization, I mean a for-profit company that'll take it down with this really great technology that has instead taken away 10 jobs. So we try to create some transitional job training for our local community, for the individuals that live right next door to you or down the road that can't find the job, that don't have the education, that perhaps made mistakes in their past. Everybody deserves to have a second chance, an opportunity to create a better community that we live in. And that's what we do. We will employ these individuals instead of a machine to take out the screws, to take it down to its base components that doesn't work. Because again, if it works, my number one goal is putting it back out there because it takes less energy to use the product as it was made to be used than for me to try and recycle it and put it into a different kind of product. So first is reuse. Then the secondary is creating the local jobs, transitional jobs. These guys come in, they've never worked a day, perhaps. They learn that they have to show up on time. They have to work. They have to produce. They need to be accountable for what they're doing. And a lot of them end up going on to much better jobs than I can possibly afford because we are a struggling nonprofit. So you need to know where the things that you purchase, where they're going to. We need to do our due diligence in order to create better futures for, for my children, for your children, and our children's children. You know, something you mentioned that, uh, again, Van Jones uh, pointed out, which was um, the, the idea that there are no disposable people and that the idea that we've, we've taken that sort of disposable culture, not just our view towards people, but also towards our physical environment, towards our buildings. I can say that with a fact that the, the, the sort of big box stores are built with a, about a 30 year life cycle and they're really to maximize their value in about 12 years and they're financed as such. And so that second stage and third stage owner is not able to put the money into it anyways and it's a disposable asset. And so if you take, if you take a few steps back from that, you, you have the sense that we're, we're in this sort of tectonic shift between a consumptive economy and, a, and going back to a productive economy again. 
and it's going to be possibly a slightly painful shift. But we, the places that we care about, I would, I would posit, were created from a productive economy, and they have certain attributes. Um, and those buildings have, and, and, um, they're durable. Uh, they're also, um, they're economical, because uh, you, don't, you don't spend, you know, a town not too far from here, Crown Point, I would posit is a great example of, of frugal urbanism. It was built before the 30-year mortgage. It was built before TIF financing. It was built before <laughs> any sort of creative financing mechanisms, in, in part because they didn't have a lot of resources, and they knew they wanted to get those to last for a long time. So um, what are some attributes of consumptive places? When you hear people talking about housing in terms of units and not homes, um, when you think about um, um, you know, places where you're able to, to furnish a house from products that are made within 100 miles, um, or those houses are perhaps made, those, those buildings are made with materials that sort of draw from that immediate hinterland and therefore have Im imbue a certain regional character to their architecture. So I, I, think, I think at a macro level, I mean, you can make the point that um, jobs are a number one moral issue today in, in the economy and in politics. And um, it's a, those two are completely related. Well, I would like to hear your questions, and I'm sure they would love to address them. But I first um, want to thank them before we get too far in. And, and this happened to us last month at the event. I'm really blown away by the quality of people we have in our community. When I think about what makes a place great and what makes me glad to live somewhere, it's people like this that are bringing their passions into their professions and, and putting them in play. Um, and so it's very exciting for me to, to hear about all of these. And I'm sure they have more to share um, in response to your questions. Would like to take some time to, uh, to field those questions now. Yeah. What specifically is the city of South Bend doing to promote a deeper commitment to sustainability? Uh, that's a, well, that's a great question. And I know that it's one that spans across multiple <coughs> departments. I can speak specifically to community investment, but I know that we have also uh, an office of sustainability within the city itself that's doing a lot of um, uh, pretty incredible things in terms of energy use and going through auditing. Air. You know, the, there's actually a large footprint in, in terms of uh, um, thinking about all the public's work facilities and the fire stations and whatnot to go through and, and take a, a new look at how they use energy. Uh, and unfortunately, I can't speak to that with any more depth to that, but I know that that's, that's something that's going on. Also, I think um, arguably, and, and then I'll get to my department, but um, we have the smartest sewers in the world. <laughs> we, we get our stuff right. Uh, and and, um, and I, I'll say that I hosted a team from Israel last week uh, to check it out. I know that we've hosted teams from Silicon Valley and the water commissioner from New York City has actually traveled out here specifically to see how we're handling wastewater treatment. And I credit Ghost and Garage a lot and, and an incredibly innovative team that's done um, work that's uncharacteristic, some, some might say, of, of, of a typical public sector in terms of an entrepreneurial zeal. Um, we're, uh, we've reduced our combined stormwater overflow. There's an issue with 800 communities in the US where um, the, given the time that they were built, the wastewater treatment and the, uh, um, the, I guess, street sewers, more or less, combine if you hit a certain level of flow, if there's a major rain event. And, uh, um, every community in the U U.S. that has this issue is going to get fined, as it should, from the EPA going forward. And so taking a, the city's on the 20-year effort for $500 million uh, to actually construct a system that will um, alleviate any of those, uh, those combined stormwater overflows. And it's both because we've got sensors that can now redirect, um, redirect effluent at a moment's notice all around the city. Um, but then also at the other end, it's... Um, some of the things that they're doing with anaerobic um, and, and sort of the, the bio treatment of wastewater. So anyways, that's a whole other side. But in terms of uh, community investment, uh, uh, my team, if you will, uh, one of them is we've added a planning team, which was absent in the city for the last, I don't know, for a long time. And uh, partly that, so we're able to sort of bring things through a finer comb. And, and I'd posit that Fellow Street is an example where rather than spending $6 million to build a new road to eradicate 30 people, eradicate a neighborhood and move 30 people out of, a, out of a community, we were able to sort of audit that and not necessarily take you know, a traffic engineering consultant's uh, numbers on their word and kind of go through that in, in a new level. Um, I, on a more positive note, I would say it's really focusing effort towards um, uh, well, a couple things. You're going to look at a renewed uh, circulation pattern downtown, I'll say as much. And uh, 
I think that will unleash some, some potential and, and sort of focus our, our activities in some existing commercial corridors. I think we're also looking at ways to animate and bring some new life uh, into some existing assets like the LaSalle Hotel. Um, it's a key initiative for us to add more beds downtown. We, uh, what we understand uh, from both our conversations with, with a number of major employers, but also with the universities and with uh, developers is that uh, there's an unmet uh, demand in our portfolios, for portfolio of housing, if you will, uh, for urban housing options. And I think that will add, uh, as you add to the downtown population, you have more people getting around on foot uh, and on bike than you will uh, necessarily on car. And so that's, that's another effort. Um, there's, a, there's a study underway right now with Transpo to bring Matt to sort of upkeep our, uh, sort of make a step change in our availability of public transit in the community, which is uh, in some ways it's, it's not where it needs to be when you, when you have to flag buses down. Um, or you have the embarrassing situation a few weeks ago where there was, I think some students had presented a video to draw funding for transit, not realizing that the bus existed. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work to be done on that, and be honest with you. Um, there, um, I think bike trails are pursuing a complete streets policy. Look for that in 2013. Um, and as we move our public, uh, public works and our streets off of the AASHTO standards, which are, um, you know, were created by the asphalt lobby, and move towards uh, a model that's looking at a shared public realm from, uh, where we include bike lanes and sidewalks and also new street projects going forward. Um, I think we're a gold ribbon, gold medal community in, in our provision of bike, ser bike lanes, but we're going to certainly enhance that going forward. I know those are just a few efforts <laughs> across the board. I don't know, it's kind of a scattered answer if that, but I'd love to like, sort of continue that conversation. So, uh, great, thank you. Um, I'd love to hear more questions to maybe pull out some more rallying cries. As much as I appreciate being home of the smartest sewers, and we do, they're super cool, but it's not <laughs> something you like, I'm moving there. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, home of complete streets, I could get behind, that's very exciting. But uh, another question. Uh, I've been seeing quite a bit of development um, in the kind of East Kent Village area as far as condos and, mm -hmm. and proper scale housing. Um, and you know, you mentioned new urban housing, so it's a mixed use space between you know, business, retail, and uh, apartment living. Um, you know, how do how do we ensure, or is the city ensuring that there isn't kind of a gentrification of that area occurring as a result of this? Really, in my opinion, upscale like. Someone like me, a uh, recent graduate from IUSB, um, <laughs> who would like to move to a more urban setting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I couldn't afford something that's currently going up there. Is is there is there growth that's occurring that that could, could reach someone like me? Well, I appreciate the question, and just by understanding that you're concerned about gentrification on the East Bank, is that more or less the and just in general? Right. I mean, not just that neighborhood, but that's a specific neighborhood where I see. I want really affordable coolness. <laughs> <laughs> yes. well, well, I appreciate the, the desire for affordable coolness. Um, there's, there's a couple, uh, um, and I would argue that probably most things that are cool are affordable. <laughs> uh, but to, to, to break that uh, into a couple pieces, one is um, there's an unmet demand for housing, and, and you see that where if, there's a mar if the market rate housing is commanding a certain premium, it means that there's probably a limited demand. So one of the things is ex ex expanding the demand will help bring down the, the price of any housing in that way. Um, secondly, I'd argue that um, we certainly are make sure that there's housing option opportunities for all in the South Bend. With over 2,000 vacant and abandoned homes, some would argue that the housing in South Bend is too affordable. And that there's a concern there about how we need to expand the types of housing that are of interest to yourself and your peers. Um, because we certainly want it, that's a population we want to draw downtown and draw into places in other neighborhoods around the community. Um, I, I would also, you know, gentrification is a really sticky issue because what's the opposite of gentrification? Blight. So you, you, it's obviously a really delicate one because you don't want to exclude anybody from the economy, but you would argue that um, the more people that you have, if you have, if it's not just the exclusive um, domain of those who are low income housing, that if you have, if you include, increase opportunities at, at sort of along the spectrum, it's a healthier community. And I think one of the problems, one of the things we need to get away from is a mindset of, 
of we have this mindset of both single use zoning, which is a problem, but also the idea of, of single income zoning, if you will. Not zoning, but it just happens. Whereas, and I think that really comes down to a function of building type. And you look at uh, building types like the Muse housing in London, which literally were the carriage housing behind um, some of the nicest housing in Belfair and uh, Mayfair and Belgravia. But those are, because of slightly smaller unit size, uh, are more affordable, but they're also participating in the nicest neighborhoods in London. So I think it's looking at, we have a really, we have a really limited palette of building types in 2012 in, in South Bend. We had a much richer palette 100 years ago. If you look at Main Street Row, these gorgeous townhouses, and you had flats, and you had single family homes, and you had uh, quad, you duplexes and, and uh, quad flats, now it's, it's almost exclusively single family homes. So I think part of it is really st um, kicking up um, the supply is more than anything else. I wouldn't be so concerned about those few um, high-end housing, uh, housing developments that are going up. I'd want more housing developments going up across town. And you may want to come to some meetings. I know you like you get around miles, but um, and uh, Just Goods is located in the in this neighborhood that he's talking about. And if you're not from South Bend, it's the east side of the river, you know, right across from the the art center and that. And just south of my shop, which is on Jefferson, um, is the former Transpo Depot, and it's. It's been leveled and it's getting prepared for redevelopment. So this this is a potential where you may want to get active about what kind of housing is going to be built there. I think there's um, there's some desire that I've seen for plans for single-family homes, and there could probably be a lot more people fit into that area. Um, but maybe there's some other lots in the neighborhood that could be built higher and and more densely too. I'd like to see more people living in the neighborhood because as is, has come up in the discussion, the more population you have, the more they can support the shops. And I feel like Just Goods is sort of doing the reverse thing. You know, we didn't wait for the people to come, but I just, you know, basically was able to be patient and I think it's going to start happening. Um, but in some, you know, it doesn't happen just all at once. It's not just magical. It's built over time, but um, we need a lot of voices to, of input into how this development does happen. And although I've seen great growth in the amount of awareness towards all of this stuff, there needs to be more. There absolutely needs to be more. We can, uh, we can sit here all day long and talk about it. We also need you guys to go back and, and talk about it to the others. Um, explain that buying local helps our local community. Um, walking to work, taking pride in where we live, cleaning up our streets. If you see trash in the ground, it's not somebody else's responsibility to pick that up. It's all of ours responsibility. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about where you're located and how people can take advantage of your services? Oh, absolutely. Um, we are currently located on um, 3702 West Sample Street. It's the old, um, it's actually two factories down from the um, chocolate factory. Perfect place for me to walk to. <laughs> um, but it's a great incubator. It's a very large factory that um, I guess was once part of the Studerbaker right. plant that had was you know thriving here, um, and they have turned it into um, areas where little businesses like mine can can try and, and eke out some of our our goals on keeping these things going. And it's a great start for us. In fact, we're looking at growing. Um, next year, we're looking at hopefully moving in towards the downtown area with a different aspect of what we do. Um, we have an e-thrift store to be able to put some of this working electronics back out into the community pretty cheaply. Um, we give away computers at Christmas time to needy families and things like that. And we also offer our IT services to other nonprofits to help them um, bridge that digital divide. And we do that currently in Michigan, but we want to bring that into Indiana. We're already doing the e-cycling here. Like I said, you can drop off Monday through Friday. However, with winter coming, you may want to call. Uh, we may be scaling back a little bit. Nobody wants to get out when it's snowing. Uh, but there is a, a tremendous amount of growth that can be done with the proper support. You're uh, in the Sample Street Business Complex, mm -hmm. which is a great example there of, of trying to transition from a consumptive back to productive economy, in addition to uh, incubators that exist at Innovation Park and, and what will be on, online at Ignition Park. Um, the idea that, that the Sample Street Business Complex creates a space for uh, uh, startups that have a little more of a hands-on, tangible aspect to them, and that's one thing that I want to continue to foster going forward. Absolutely. It's always dangerous to drop stats, but I think I came across one recently that was compelling that I want to say in West Michigan, if uh, consumers 
uh, shifted 10% of their buying towards locally owned companies, it would represent a $400 million boost to the economy in West Michigan. So there's a huge leverage there if uh, you keep those dollars local. And so that obviously is particularly relevant to these bank where you have a lot of great um, locally owned shops. But just to sort of think about that as you go forward. So I know the sign-up sheet was going around. So if you're not already getting our e-newsletter or tuned into us on social media, we've been plugging all of these events and trying to highlight them for you to take advantage of all the great things that um, South Bend has going on. And I know we have a final question from Jennifer. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. We, uh, I just came from a public meeting tonight, and I know uh, on, on the west side, but we uh, thoroughly, very much heavily involved. There are a number of public meetings on some of the projects recently in East Bank, and uh, um, I know that both the city's website, uh, there are a number of things posted. If you were to go to community investment, we'll have in planning, we'll have some things there. But also, oftentimes they go through uh, common council and they put a call out. Uh, but I think uh, one of things going forward, this this conversation came up this week with uh, the board at DTSB of, of how do we get the, the good news out there. Uh, we um, we had a meeting recently, the Redevelopment Commission. I, we had seven wins, if you will, seven big good stories for the for the economy in South Bend. There was not a single me member of the media present. To a few weeks earlier, when, when we were in the sort of thick of it with uh, Fellow Street, you would have, it was like you know, Brian Kelly's press conference, right? I mean, there were 100 reporters, and then nobody was there for the good stories. So we need to take a more proactive approach to getting the word out there. Uh, and so look for that. Uh, and you know, we're looking at a couple of different ways of getting both through social media and also through some traditional media fronts. So I appreciate that. Great. Well, thank you all for coming out again. Um, there are uh, refreshments in the back, so please don't leave before you get a little something. Um, and thank you very much to our panel for coming out.